I called my friend Kevin Volpe, a star economist and medical doctor who helped build one of the most successful applied behavioral economics research groups in the world. I wanted Kevin's perspective. Why did he think we'd been so unsuccessful at making behavior change stick? Kevin offered up some unforgettable words of wisdom. When we diagnose someone with diabetes, we don't put them on insulin for a month, take them off of it, and expect them to be cured. In medicine, doctors recognize that chronic diseases require a lifetime of treatment. Why do we assume that behavior change is any different? Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of Wharton faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. We'll be covering a diverse range of topics, bringing you the latest insights and knowledge that you can apply to your life and to work. So get ready to dive into new ideas with The Ripple Effect. Well, and great to be joined by Katie Milkman, uh, Wharton uh, School Professor of Operations, Information and Decision. She's also co-director of the Behavior Change for Good and author of the book, How to Change, the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. Katie, always great to talk to you. How have you been? Always great to talk to you too, Dan. I've been great. I hope you have been as well. I have been. All right. So take us first into the book itself and and really the kind of the genesis of why you wanted to write about this. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. You know, this has been the focus of all my research. The, the topic of how do we create positive behavior change. It's the reason that Angela Duckworth and I co-founded the um, Behavior Change for Good initiative at Wharton and Penn. And at a certain point, I felt, look, I've collected enough insights and knowledge that there's real value to share with the world if we can put it all together in a digestible format and explain here, here are the things we've learned that can help people make the positive changes they want in their lives and that can help organizations steer their employees and customers towards positive behavior change. And really, we're talking about behavior changes that can occur at any point in the course of the year, in a course of a person's life. It really kind of, you know, we're constantly kind of looking at these potential moments in our lives throughout the course of our, our time here. Absolutely right. So there there's everything from um, making a change related to my health. Maybe I want to get in shape or start eating differently. Uh, maybe I want to quit smoking or I want to quit drinking, right? So those are all health behavior changes that are important uh, to changes around my finance. Uh, I, I might want to start investing. I want to set aside something for retirement. I want to cut back on spending. So there's financial changes. And then, of course, changes with your productivity at work, the way that you interact with your family. Uh, every kind of change that you can think of really is what we study and this book is designed to help people achieve it for themselves or help others achieve those kinds of changes. Well, obviously, one of the ones that uh, you talk about and a lot of people talk about ends up being around New Year's and, and the resolutions that we make uh, that we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and maybe we hold them for a couple of days after and then things kind of dissolve. Take us into that mindset of of people making those resolutions and either following through the, on them or not being able to? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, let me just say that I am actually a big fan of New Year's resolutions. I think that that, is, that makes me unusual because most people write them off and say, you know, this is a, a whim. Most of them don't succeed. Uh, why would we do this? I've done research with uh, Fortin, former Wharton PhD student Heng Shen Dai, who's now a professor at UCLA's Anderson School, on what we call the fresh start effect, along with Jason Reese, also a Wharton affiliate. And what we have shown is that there are moments in our lives like New Year's that give us the sense of a new beginning and a fresh start and that make us feel separated from our past failures. So on January 1, you can look at things that you didn't achieve in the last year that you meant to get around to. You know, I wanted to learn Spanish. I wanted to figure out how to really be on time regularly at my meetings. I wanted to eat healthier and I didn't and I failed. But that was the old me and this is the new me. So they create the sense of dissociation. And it's not just New Year's. Like I said, that's the most famous, but at the start of a new week, the start of a new month, um, following birthdays, following holidays that we associate with fresh starts. So think Labor Day, not Valentine's Day. Right. What we see in data set after data set is that people at those moments set goals more often. But as you point out, many of those goals fail. And so I think while it's exciting 
and promising that these are moments when people will be willing to bite off an attempt at change that they wouldn't normally pursue. And that can be useful, especially if, if it's a one and done type of change, right? Make an important appointment uh, to get a mammogram, for instance, or um, set up an auto deduction from my paychecks to go put money straight into a 401k. Those kinds of things, right? You can have one moment where you're feeling ready and it can have long-term consequences. But for most things, a moment of motivation is not enough to carry us forward. And that's really what the rest of my book is about is I think one of the key barriers to successful change is that most of it is, I, oh, I have a goal. I'll just get there. As opposed to thinking strategically about what are the obstacles I might face and let me make a plan that can actually tackle those obstacles. And that's based in science. And the reason I wrote this book is we now have a lot of evidence-based solutions that need to be tailored, right? If, if the reason you're, for instance, not going to the gym is you find it absolutely miserable, then you need a different solution to get you there than if the reason is your life is too crowded to fit it in, right? So depending on what the barrier is, you need different solutions. Um, but we have a lot to say about that. And so um, once people start using the evidence, they can make a lot more progress with those fresh start moments. How much concern is there, though, if people try it to make a change and don't succeed and they give up that that becomes kind of the pattern that they fall into more so than as you said kind of looking strategically at ways to be able to make sure that you do complete the task yeah it's a great question and i think it's a thing that we often worry about is sort of if you um look at you know what people say commonly they'll say things like oh you can't teach an old dog new tricks which might suggest that over the course of a lifespan it becomes harder to make change Maybe after multiple failures, we uh, give up on ourselves. For what it's worth, in our research studies, we always look at things like, um, you know, we've we've developed an intervention to try to help people make this positive change. Uh, and we look at does uh, the effectiveness vary as a function of age? And we very rarely see that it does. We, we rarely find actually a lot of, we call it moderation, a lot of variables, a lot of features of a person that seem to say, oh, shoot, this intervention only works for this type of, of person. So I actually am very optimistic that if people are willing to stand up and try again, um, they will they will be able to make progress. And the fresh start effect does seem to apply pretty broadly as opposed to narrowly. It's not as if it's only a phenomenon we see in our 20s or our 30s. And then once we've been fooled by enough New Year's resolutions that didn't work out, we stop making them. So humans are shockingly optimistic and, and good at, I think that's what the fresh start is really about, right? We keep telling ourselves we're good at sort of tricking ourselves into this time will be different, but that probably is an adaptive trait to be that optimistic and ready to try again. All right, I'll get up and start, but I'll wait till after I do the interview before we start to do it, all right? I promise. <laughs> Fair enough. You talk also in the book about uh, kind of a Mary Poppins approach to behavior change, meaning what exactly? One thing that I think is really fascinating and that, that leads to this name is that uh, this comes out of research by Ayelet Fishbach at the University of Chicago and Caitlin Woolley at Cornell. Um, what they've found is that most of us, when we pursue change, our, our intuition is we should just take the most direct approach, um, the most effective, efficient path to get to where we want to be. So say you want to ace your math test. Um, the first approach you'd take would probably be to say, you know, I'm just going to sit down and study and I'm not going to I'm going to block all distractions. I'm going to do nothing else for the rest of the day. That's how I'll get there. Um, or if you want to get in shape, you'd say, let me find the most painful workout I could do at the gym uh, that will maximally burn calories. But interestingly, what they've shown in the research is this is a mistake. A small subset of people take a different approach, which is to actually try to find the most fun way to study for their math test, maybe quizzing themselves with a friend or uh, you know, hopping it into a Zumba class. And it, while it may get you closer to your goal at a slower rate, it actually ends up being better because you persist, because you go back to the gym after a positive experience. You'll study for the next test too after an enjoyable um, first few minutes study, or, or you'll, you'll keep the study and going even late into the night if you found a way to do it that isn't miserable. So this persistence is a really important part of success. And we neglect the importance of fun. So the Mary Poppins effect is really just a description of what Mary Poppins sings about in, the, in her famous um, verses saying, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. She understood and communicated this when it comes to children, that we actually need to find a way to make it enjoyable to pursue goals. But it turns out that 
adults are wired the same way as kids. Maybe a little bit less. Uh, it's a little bit less extreme. We have a little bit more ability to exert self control. Our prefrontal for, uh, cortex is more developed. But just like kids, we are present biased, which means we care more about instant gratification than long term rewards. And rather than trying to work against that, what we need to do is lean into it and try to find ways that we can make it more enjoyable in the moment to do the things that are going to help us achieve our goals in order to serve um, a, a, the long-term benefit. So it's a mistake to constantly be looking for the most efficient path to achieve your goal because you will quit at a higher rate than if you look for a path that you will find pleasurable. And we've done research on a topic called temptation bundling, which is uh, when you find a way to link something you find tempting with a mm -hmm. chore that you would otherwise procrastinate on, this is a way of using that Mary Poppins insight. Um, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. For instance, you only let yourself exercise while indulging and watching your favorite uh, lowbrow TV show on Netflix. That's an example of temptation bundling. Or you only um, let yourself listen to your favorite podcast while you're doing household chores. Or you only get to eat a really unhealthy but delicious meal when spending time with a difficult mentee at work. Mm -hmm. So those would be temptation bundles. And we found in our research that through temptation bundling, we can help ourselves achieve more. It's another way of using this Mary Poppins effect. So also take a little time and, and talk about this concept of the flake out that, that you talk about. And, and really, I, I mean, how you can try and go about combating it. Yeah, flake out, I think, is a vastly underestimated problem. A lot of our goals, they just don't stay top of mind. And uh, as a result, we flake out on doing things that are, are really important to us uh, because we haven't structured our lives properly around them. So we tend to underestimate the importance of this issue. I, I'd say it's very closely related to forgetting. Um, simply, you know, you meant to vote, yeah. but oh my gosh, it slipped off of your to-do list. Or um, you meant to get uh, vac that vaccine or get your annual checkup or take care of this important issue with an employee who's been struggling at work, but you just flaked out on, on fitting it into your schedule. Often it's one time, but highly impactful decisions that we flake out on with major consequences. And uh, in general, what we find is that people underestimate this as a, as a barrier to follow through on key goals, but we can combat it using pretty simple tools from, you know, of course, the most obvious being things like digital reminders and calendaring, but some of the uh, less obvious which I think are also important, you can um, actually get better results. And there's wonderful research by Peter Golwitzer of NYU on the fact that simply making if-then plans where and he calls them implementation intentions dramatically increase the likelihood we follow through. So not just saying, I plan to go to the gym or I plan to schedule this meeting, but saying, if it's 4 p.m. on a Thursday, then I'll be at the gym or uh, every day after work, I will schedule time for meditation. By having the if-then component, we actually end up seeing dramatically higher follow-through. And there's some really wonderful research studies that have been done showing that we can use this as a tool to nudge people towards follow-through on important behaviors like voter turnout, vaccination. I was involved in one effort about a decade ago where we went, ran a randomized controlled trial with a company that was trying to encourage people to come to an annual flu shot clinic where they'd be giving free on-site vaccines. And what we found is sending a reminder that let people know the dates and times when they could come and the location of free vaccine clinics, that is useful. But we, at no cost, uh, increase the effectiveness of that reminder by adding a simple prompt for people to write the date and time when they intended to show up. And that, uh, that simple prompt to make a concrete plan led to about a four percentage point increase in vaccinations. And these are the kinds of things that I think organizations and individuals tend to think, you know, I don't need to write down my plan or prompt someone to think through the date and time. Why would that matter? And yet making it more concrete works because, um, first of all, that's the way memories are stored. We uh, need a cue that triggers the memory. So the date and time serves as a cue. When you see that date and time now, you're much more likely to realize, oh, this is when I said I would do X because this is how memory is stored. And so it's also more likely you literally put it in your calendar and you now get a digital or electronic reminder. But again, th these are the kinds of things we've done experiments where we said to people, will you pay us to get a reminder, for instance, to follow through on a behavior you intend to do? In fact, we even tried things where they were behaviors people would get paid to do. And people said, no, 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 no. I don't want to be paying for a reminder. And yet <laughs> when we automatically sign people up for reminders and charge them for them, we see 
higher earnings and, and better follow through than when people have the optionality because they underestimate the value of such tools. And then there is the problem of laziness, which I think we all at times <laughs> kind of fall into for at least a little bit. Yes. So we all have this issue. And I actually like I like to say that it's a, it's a, a pro of the human operating system rather than a con. So my background is in computer science and computer scientists know that the best algorithms are efficient, lazy algorithms that take shortcuts rather than searching every possible solution. So laziness is a good feature for a system to have built in that you look for the path of least resistance. But when it comes to achieving goals, it, of course, can be a problem if we are looking for the, the fastest route to success um, or the, the simplest um, path. So there's sort of two ways that laziness, I think, comes up in the human operating system and is important to keep in mind and think about if you want to build solutions that will help people achieve their goals. The first actually has to do with a well-studied and pretty well-known phenomenon, which is that we succumb to defaults. We are very susceptible right. to whatever is automatic. So if you get a new computer, it comes with a whole bunch of default settings, right? A default background, default font size, and so on. And, and most of us just accept those and move on. And P.S., that means it's important to set them wisely in ways that will set people up for success. Um, one of my favorite studies showing how important it is to set defaults that people will just passively accept because they're a bit lazy wisely was one that was done here at, at the University of Pennsylvania in our medical system. And it involved um, changing the way that drug prescriptions were automatically sent to pharmacies to prioritize sending generic drugs so that actually doctors, if they wanted to prescribe a brand name drug, let's say Lipitor, which is chemically identical to its generic cousin, um, but much more expensive because it's a brand name drug, if you want to instead see a higher rate of prescribing generics, which all doctors and insurers agree is better, there's higher mm -hmm. compliance by patients when their drugs are cheaper um, and, every and everyone saves money. So what they did is they just made that the default. So instead of the doctor having to remember to prescribe the generic, they remember the brand name, they type in Lipitor, but unless they check a box saying, no, I really mean Lipitor, not the generic, the generic get, was automatically sent to the, to the um, pharmacy that was filling the drugs. And this overnight made, um, ensured that Penn Medicine was one of the best hospitals in the area on generic prescriptions. They went from something like 75% of drugs being prescribed as generics to almost 100%. And there was one um, one drug where this didn't work and it was actually a drug where the generic and the, uh, and the brand name were different and there were chemical differences. So you didn't see this bump. It's a really nice illustration. It basically says anytime you can set a wise default, that's right. really important for setting yourself up for success. So this for, for an individual could be something like I stock my pantry only with healthy snacks so that the default snack is something that's easy. Or I, I set my um, default website to be the New York Times as opposed to Facebook. So I spend less time on social media. So those are sort of personal defaults or organizations can have wise defaults that they set to try to support success in the workplace, whether that's we by default don't have meetings from nine to 10. You have to override something in order to make that possible. So everyone starts with focused work. Um, right. or, or settings in computers, settings with, uh, in terms of retirement savings, defaulting everyone into enroll in a 401k. So that, that would be the first way. So the other way in which defaults are, I think, important is that um, we are have, have it, creatures of habit. We build habits in order to um, essentially short circuit having to think deeply about decisions, right? So it's very helpful not to have to think every morning about shampooing your hair, brushing your teeth, what you'll eat for breakfast. You form some habits around that. And as a result, you just have a shortcut. You don't have to process deeply. Oh, what what will I do? But habits can be harmful if they're not supporting your goals. So there is a whole large literature on how do we intentionally form good habits. And I think there's been some wonderful books that, that cover this quite nicely, like, um, the, the Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, Atomic Habits um, by James Clear, and Good Habits, Bad Habits by Wendy Wood. The simple story is that, as with animals, humans are um, sort of, when we repeat a behavior and are rewarded for it, over time it becomes more habituated. Um, right. The more frequently you can repeat the set of actions, it's almost like practice, right? This is how you learn the piano. You sit down, you practice, you repeat. We can do the same thing with habits, trying to say for a, form a habit around exercise. Research shows that if we pay people to go to the gym eight times in a month, 
as opposed to just once and then take payments away and look what happens after. Now there's no reward. We see the people who are paid to go repeatedly habituate and continue to exercise at a higher rate than people who were only rewarded for going once, even though there's no longer any reason to do it. So the key idea here is if you have um, the desire to form a habit, you want to think of it like practicing a new skill. You want to try to repeat it as frequently as possible. Find a way to reward yourself. That might be through temptation bundling, making it fun, or it might be by announcing to friends that you're doing this, simply tracking your progress. Uh, and and over the course of that repetition, you're going to build something that starts to feel more habitual and become more natural. You may want to piggyback it on something you already do. Um, having a, a, a time, for instance, you know, there's research showing that if you piggyback flossing habits on after you brush your teeth, that's actually more effective than just saying, I'm going to floss or trying to floss before you remember to, to brush your teeth. So tying it to something you already do can other, also be a useful tool. Final question for you. What areas then, with all this work you've done in your career around behavior change, what still is out there? What, what, are, what are you looking at next that is kind of the next hill to climb? Some of the most exciting work, I think, in behavior change that we've done and that others have done shows the power of our social networks in influencing our behaviors. The people around us show us what's possible. They show us how to achieve um, and signal what's appropriate. There's some really wonderful research that's been done by Scott Carell um, at the University of California showing that, uh, for instance, the randomly assigned college roommate you get affects your grade. Because the person, if, if you end up with someone who is essentially um, a better student, you end up, hey, they don't go out on Thursdays and Fridays. They <laughs> study like this and, and you do too. But someone who was less studious, oh, they do go out and party. Maybe that's what I should be doing. So we are really shaped by these random allocations of our compatriots. And what I am looking at at the Behavior Change for Good initiative in collaboration with Angela Duckworth, who's my um, key partner in crime on this, is how can we use that insight to build better social interventions that that help connect people with peers who have shared goals and help facilitate um, peer interactions that that increase success. So we're doing work right now in the space of education around this to try to see if we can leverage peer effects to improve student outcomes and reduce student dropout from school um, at the college level. But we're also interested in, in workplace pure effects and generally leveraging this power of of groups as opposed to simply studying individuals and how we can help people um, in isolation. Katie, always great to talk with you. Thanks very much for your time today. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to speak. It's always a pleasure on my end as well. You got it. Wharton's Katie Milkman. Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and Leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.